turn to, to this morning's uh, presentation. So i um, delighted to have Professor uh, Becky Willis from uh, the University of Lancaster to talk about democratizing the net zero transition. Um, Becky's a professor of energy uh, and climate governance at Lancaster University, where she runs the Climate uh, Citizens Initiative, investigating how to build engagement into climate policymaking. Uh, she was one of four expert leads running the um, Climate Assembly UK, which was commissioned by uh, Parliament. Uh, previously, she advised government as vice chair of the Sustainable Development Commission uh, and was director of Green Alliance. Uh, and I can uh, wholeheartedly recommend her book, uh, Too Hot to Handle, uh, which has got so many different uh, elements which uh, apply to uh, thinking about decarbonising transport. So I'm delighted we've got Becky with us this morning. Uh, you came to hear her, not me, so I'll hand over at this point. Thanks, Becky. Thank you very much, Greg. It's really nice to, to be here um, in quite a momentous week. Uh, I, I, um, uh, early last week, I was down in, in Parliament for uh, a year since Climate Assembly UK, so I'm going to talk about that a bit. Um, just let me share my screen. There we go. OK, so I'm going to start with a bit of instant research. Um, I'm going to ask you to answer a question in the chat because um, I want to sort of take the temperature of the room. So can you tell me um, how you think we're doing on climate policy in the UK? Just a few words, sort of your own personal view on how we're doing on climate change. If you're listening from outside the UK, then you can comment on any other country as well. If it is another country, just put it in brackets so that we know and let's uh, I'll just pull the chat up and, and we'll see what people are thinking. OK. So there's a lot of uh, poorly, too slow, terrible, uh, all mouth, no trousers, uh, not willing to take hard choices. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, chaotic, disappointing. Poorly aligned with two to three degree warming. Yeah, so I think the picture is quite, quite stark there. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how we're straight away we get the, ah, oh, it's terrible, and then some, and, and then some sort of not quite qualifications, but, but, but developments of that thing. Uh, yeah, Nick saying actually reinforcing undesirable trajectories, um, ambitious, but a lack of clear plan. So um, I think that, um, you know, not surprisingly, a group of uh, experts, professionals like ourselves are, I think the overwhelming emotion that I feel and that many of us feel is frustration. Um, and that, sorry, just let me get back on Zoom. Um, I, I think, um, you know, there is a huge frustration with the state we're in, which I think you uh, encapsulated with your comments there in the chat. Just yesterday, yesterday Green Alliance uh, published a stock take of UK climate policy um, clipped here, which says how much the UK is still lagging behind um, you know, not not doing what it can to meet the uh, the targets it herself is, has set in terms of net zero by 2050, leaving aside the question of whether that target itself is enough. Um, I think it's important to note that this frustration is not just, um, you know, one uh, on the part of campaigners, but also um, obviously scientists, many progressive businesses. And actually, if you look at the polling data, people as well. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge, as, as some people, some of you were starting to do in the chat, in the chat, that there is a genuine commitment from not all, but some parts of government and, um, and again, from some businesses to this agenda. Um, but this uh, huge policy gap that's been identified and the Climate Change Committee has now sort of year on year come up with measuring the ever wider policy gap, the gap between, um, between um, the targets that the government set and practice. I think um, also, as some, of, as some of you noted, the problem is um, partly not doing enough, but it's actually partly the huge ambiguity and inconsistency of climate policy, which I am now witnessing firsthand in my role as uh, 
an advisor to the legal team against the uh, Cumbria coal mine, something that I've been involved in for the past couple of years. And there, you know, basically uh, planning law is incredibly ambiguous on climate change, such that you can actually mount a legal challenge to claim that uh, building a coal mine is consistent with UK climate policy. And that comes about in part as well by um, from very deliberate action by high carbon economic interests. And this is you know, really, really well documented if you look at the work of people like uh, Naomi Oreskes and others, um, the recent discourses of delay piece by William Lamb and colleagues. Um, it shows that there are very deliberate, very uh, well organized attempts by high carbon economic interests to obfuscate and delay. So faced with this situation, um, there's a common reaction that I see, and it's one that I, uh, I've, I've come to think of as cockpitism. Cockpitism is a phrase borrowed from the, um, the uh, Dutch uh, social scientist Martin Hager, and it is this idea that we, uh, the experts, need to be in charge. That you know that that, that we we failed as democracies. Essentially, we need to do things quickly and radically, and so we need to put experts in charge. We need to fly the planet the way that um, we need to manage the planet the way that uh, pilots fly a plane. Um, and this is most, uh, most explicitly said by uh, James Lovelock, the earth scientist, who actually said we may, we may have to put democracy on hold for a while um, because of the severity of climate change. Now, Lovelock said explicitly what I think is actually a sort of common implicit feeling amongst the climate community. Um, you see it, for example, in the work around earth systems governance, the idea that it should be um, uh, that it should be a sort of a panel of well-meaning scientists who steer us, who are in that cockpit steering us to safety. And I think it, even more pervasively, you say this in absolutely common language in the policy world about uh, public acceptance. This, this idea that we as experts know what needs to happen and that all we have to do is, is, is get people to accept that that's the answer. Another common phrase is taking people with us. And both those phrases basically put people as the problem. Um, the, uh, the, the, the other problem with the sort of cockpitism approach is that, you know, as well as being incredibly top down, it tends to think of policies in terms of sort of optimal and efficient and so on, um, rather than um, whether they're policies that will appeal to and motivate people. It tends to result in what I've come to think of as stealth strategies, where we try and do as much as we can without people noticing, um, you know, no... Um, no coincidence, I think, that the government's focused on offshore wind and not onshore, literally as out of sight as possible. Um, and these policies then, because their attempts at stealth strategy, at doing things without people noticing, if people do notice, then that trust in government is really eroded. And it also um, means that we um, gravitate toward big kit solutions, um, uh, negative emissions, technologies, um, nuclear fusion, um, as, as Boris Trailed in his conference speech a while ago. Um, it, it's a very sort of technologically focused um, uh, strategy, it tends to be. Um, so I really want to turn that on its head and ask the question, what would happen if we actually uh, leaned into democracy if we stopped assuming that people were the problem. And certainly, again, when you look at the polling data and you look at the experience from the deliberative processes that I've been involved in, and I'll come on to talk about Climate Assembly UK, it actually becomes more and more clear that people might not be the problem here, that actually it's a breakdown in that relationship between um, between uh, citizens and state, which is why, you know, the headline um, that I talk about in, in my book is that we actually need more democracy to tackle the climate crisis, crisis and not less. Um, 
I think at the moment, you know, the social contract is the oldest idea in political thinking. And, and at its heart is this idea that um, we as individuals are uh, pr quite prepared, quite happy to um, give up some of our own personal freedoms in order for um, some kind of ruler, some kind of state to be able to do things in the collective interest that we cannot do individually. Um, you know, at its heart, that's kind of basic safety. It's also obviously the welfare state and so on. So that idea of the social contract is at the heart of um, our conception of, of government and politics. But I think that that's not working well for climate change. I think what we have for climate change at the moment is a sort of silent standoff. We have the situation in which, on the one hand, as I've already outlined, um, government doesn't think that uh, that the public um, is willing to to, uh, to 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 get behind them on this, uh, worried about that public acceptance, and so is trying to um, you know do whatever it can without actually um, without actually building a mandate from people. Um, it's trying to uh, sort of sideline the problem into something that can be handled through different uh, different technological approaches um, without actually having the conversation with um, the people that vote for it. So that's one side of the silent standoff. And then on the other side, um, you have um, uh, people, you have us as citizens who actually, as the polls show, are incredibly worried about climate change. You've probably seen the headlines this morning, a huge piece of research with 10,000 young people showing that they're actually incredibly worried about their future. And the sting in the tail of that work that came out today is that they're also very cynical about the ability of governments to play their part. And so you have sort of cynical citizens on the one side and um, and government on the other who, you know, who, who are actually missing reading the, the the public mood and you have this silent standoff uh, which means that you know both sides are sort of quietly blaming each other without talking about it so what I've been asking is what would happen if you actually rethink that relationship between the citizen and state on, on climate change? And I've taken my inspiration here from the work of deliberative Democrats like um, John Dreisek and uh, Jane Mansbridge, who argue that actually our conception, the sort of realist conception of democracy as, you know, something that is centred on these elections that we have every five years when you put a piece of paper in a box, they're a very thin conception of democracy. And it's incredibly hard to give your politicians the message about what you want to do on what you want done on climate change by you know choosing which box to put an, a cross in every five years and instead they argue for a much richer conception of democracy as a sort of constantly negotiated social contract between citizens and states in all kinds of different ways and 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 fora um, and, and, and they argue that that much richer conception of democracy is absolutely necessary for tackling big long term issues, not just climate change, but um, issues like pensions and social care as well. And, you know, this might sound sort of hugely idealistic. We need to recreate democracy. But actually, at, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to this. Is there anyone i mean vanishingly few people out there are voting for you know 2.5 three degrees of warming you know nearly all people when um when and, and again research uh research bears this out when um when confronted with the facts of climate breakdown are actually desperate for government to take action. So if you hold that as your core, then the question is, how do you actually develop that productive relationship? So I had been thinking this with the work that I did with politicians. I'd, I'd, I'd sort of been looking at both sides of the social contract, both parties to the social contract and thinking, well, there's things going wrong on both sides here. And so I was part of a group who actually um, advocated for Climate Assembly UK and um, then was really pleased to be able to go on to help deliver that as an as an expert lead um, alongside um, Jim Watson, Lorraine Whitmarsh and um, and Chris Stark of the Climate Change Committee. And uh, it wasn't a perfect process, I can tell you in the in the 
in the in the uh, Q and A if you want what I think I'd do differently. But basically, the point of Climate Assembly UK was to recreate the UK in miniature in this room here in Birmingham. We managed three weekends in a room in Birmingham uh, before COVID hit. The last weekend was done online, but those people that we brought together were perfectly representative of the UK as a whole in terms of age, ethnicity, um, socioeconomic background, and also really importantly views on climate change. So they mirrored the um, the the, the Mori poll asking how concerned are you about climate change? Um, most deliberative processes like this have, have, um, have that uh, representative sample at their core and they have three phases to the actual process. They have an evidence phase where people learn um, climate science, climate action and so on. They get to uh, learn from witnesses and expert speakers. Um, and then the core is the deliberation where people talk to each other um, and uh, to the experts and witnesses. Um, and the thing there is that people can bring their own experience to the table. So, um, you know, you had people learning a lot from each other about people's different life situations and what that meant for climate policy. And then they developed their um, recommendations, which was a sort of phone book sized um, a uh, list of things that need to be done across the main areas looked at and transport was one of those. So Climate Assembly UK was one, but there have also been um, a whole host now of local uh, juries, including one in my hometown, Kendall. Um, Leeds was, I think, first out of the block, but um, lots of areas of the UK and also in France and Ireland. And I've been tracking those processes as well. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a readout from uh, the Climate Assembly, but I'd really recommend if you haven't to have a little delve into their findings. Um, so this is a bit of a busy slide, but I just wanted to recreate in full the principles that, um, that the citizens came up with. Um, this was at the end of their first weekend when they'd had a lot of introduction to climate change and they developed themselves and voted on these principles. Um, and the one at the top, informing and educating everyone, I see that as actually um, sort of saying we need that dialogue between citizen and state. Um, you know, saying that a lot of this stuff has been done sort of on the sly through stealth and that we need that uh, a much more upfront conversation with that. There was always a huge focus on fairness. Um, the citizens defined that their own ways and all in different ways. And you saw the politics coming out in definitions of fairness. But fairness included, um, obviously, for the most vulnerable, but also between regions, um, between different employment sectors and so on. And then again and again, we saw this theme of leadership coming through. So um, they're very keen on cross party uh, consensus. Um, you'll see uh, further down there a joined up approach, long term planning, urgency, all these sort of points around leadership. Um, and uh, another really crucial one, I think, which is really relevant for transport is that last one around local community engagement. And when I was observing the discussions, I saw time and again this um, this wish for more localised strategies to come forward. And, that you know, we've had an incredibly top down model of climate policy in this country. And um, I think that the uh, assembly participants really felt that they wanted local strategies that suited the um, particularities and the and, 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 and the sort of culture and um, the, the culture and character of the local areas. Um, on transport, um, so transport was an interesting one because what people um, really emphasised was they wanted to maintain their um, essentially uh, a level of freedom and choice about how they travelled. And um, there was quite an attachment to the car, as you would imagine. And so they voted for relatively modest reductions in car use. They were told because that's what the evidence shows that um, that we need to reduce car use. But they went for a mod relatively modest reduction in car use. Um, they had to develop a strategy that got us to net zero. Um, that was the job that they had. And so they actually went um, pretty strongly for, um, uh, for uh, rapid and relatively far reaching um, change in vehicle technologies. So stop selling the most polluting cars, SUVs. They saw that as sort of pretty obvious and um, ban on petrol and diesel and hybrid car sales in uh, 2030 to 2035, I think they said. Um, so that was sort of 
of uh, you know uh, th 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 that was that's going further and faster than the government have indicated so far. Um, they were also very keen, not just on investment in, but also in control of public transport, bringing public transport back into um, back into um, uh, the control of local authorities. And again, this theme of localisation. So um, localisation here, meaning basically reducing travel demand through um, reducing the need to travel by having um, shops and services, um, workplaces and so on, much more local. So um, it was a really interesting picture on transport because, um, and I'd really recommend Gillian Annabel's blog, which I've linked to here, and I'll, I'll share these slides after. Um, uh, Gillian makes, uh, Gillian was very involved in the uh, transport theme. She was there all the way through and um, her observation was that um, was that people were actually prepared to see quite radical changes in order to keep that sort of core personal freedom around around transport. So it's not at all, you know, get off my lawn, don't, um, you know, don't don't regulate transport. It was actually, OK, this is what we're prepared to do in order to, you know, keep driving when we want. And so as, as Gillian writes here, it does show that tough measures can be accepted if the objectives and the trade-offs are made clear. So um, my reflections, having taken part in Climate Assembly and, um, you know, having done a lot of follow up work to it, not least uh, here, this was last week in Parliament when uh, David Attenborough sat down with some of the... Um, uh, David Attenborough sat down with some of the uh, the participants from Climate Assembly UK um, and the participants actually finally got their chance to come to Parliament, meet their MPs, hear a bit about what had happened since the publication of the report. Um, so having, following, having followed that process, the first thing I would say is that people in these processes take their job incredibly seriously. The amount of learning that went on, one person said she'd love doing it because it was a free education. Um, and I'm now part of their Facebook group where they're constantly sort of sharing ideas for what could happen next, what they could do next. And quite a few of the assembly members have gone on to do quite a lot of their own, uh, changing their own lives, but also their own sort of campaigning and so on around climate. Having said that, um, when you when you involve citizens, they think differently to specialists. They tend to see um, much more, they tend to see the wider picture. So for example, on, on um, negative emissions technologies, they weren't a fan at all of um, technological solutions like direct air capture, like um, some of the other um, carbon capture and storage um, methods, because they basically thought it was a get out of jail free card. They thought it would distract from the actual job at hand. And so they rejected those technologies, but it wasn't a case of, do you like technology X or Y? It was actually a sort of much more sophisticated account of how technology X or Y um, affects or doesn't affect that bigger picture. And so that wider, and, and I think often more sort of ethical grounded view is incredibly useful to policymakers. I think in running these processes though there is a trade-off in how much you talk about the big picture, the sort of earth systems, economic systems type big picture and you get citizen input on that um, versus the detail about you know um, how do we design a policy for heat pumps or um, you know electric vehicle charging. You absolutely can do both both ends of that um, but the danger is that if you do the detail you obscure the big picture and vice versa and that's one of the things that I've really learned from Climate Assembly UK and that I'm taking forward now um, and in fact after this uh, the Scotland ran their own Climate Assembly and they tried to put in a lot more of that sort of big picture you know what is the future uh, you know up to the level of what is the future of capitalism um, and I think they were maybe more successful than Climate Assembly UK in doing that. Um, obviously, processes like this can't take away those issues of, of power and vested interests. Um, they are there in, 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 in policy and politics, um, but it can shine a light on them. And actually, when you looked at the citizens had a chance to um, raise their own issues, and that's often when these questions of 
power um, and corporate accountability came up. There was a lot there about the lobbying power of big corporations. There was a, a sense of, you know, really wanting a sort of a fairer um, access and, and less influence by those big companies. And we didn't sort of focus on that as an issue. So it's interesting that it bubbled up anyway. And obviously, lastly, and most obviously, with these processes, it's all in the implementation. And I think that Climate Assembly UK has been maybe relatively weak and indirect because it was commissioned by Parliament, not government. And government has sort of taken a polite interest, but hasn't shown that um, track of what it's done with the recommendations, which I think is a shame. That might still happen in the net zero strategy. We don't know. Um, but obviously, these processes are only as useful as... Um, as uh, the, the uses people find for them. There's an interesting debate, which again, I can go into in Q&A if you want, about how you can use processes like Climate Assembly to actually start a dialogue with the wider public. And there's good evidence to show that um, in the same way that we trust, we tend to trust the results of uh, jury trials, even though we didn't sit through the whole trial, um, people tend to trust the outcomes of these processes because they feel like people like me were included. And if someone like me sat through this and came out with this solution, it would be likely that I would think the same. So I want to finish with um, a sort of general and um, more personal uh, account of what's next for this. What does this mean for the way we do uh, uh, climate policy? Well, I think at its very heart, and this, you know, this sounds sort of almost banal, um, but I don't think it's happening at the moment. At the, the very fount of this, we need to speak out more. Government needs to speak out more about um, about, uh, uh, you know, stating the climate crisis front and centre of everything that it does. Um, you know, this is why protest is incredibly helpful because it is a way of speaking out. Um, and when I, when I speak about this as a public talk, I tend to say to people that the less sort of obvious you look as a protester, um, the more effective that protest is because it, it, it shows that, you know, concern about climate change is absolutely widespread. Um, but the flip side to that uh, speaking out is also listening. And um, when I talk to policymakers about this, um, the thing that they find really hard to grapple with is this idea that actually people have a huge amount to bring to policy development because they have, you know, we're experts in our own lives. We can tell you what would or wouldn't work in our current circumstances. So that the listening and the accepting the, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the practical wisdom that people bring to the process is, is really important. Um, what I'm really interested to focus on now, um, following on from the kind of big bang of climate assembly, is to look at how you embed public engagement and deliberation into policy making as a matter of course, maybe as an alternative to the absolutely stultifying six week consultation process, which obviously attracts people who um, have most at stake. Uh, the consultation process is incredibly self-selecting and actually has quite a high um, uh, high barrier in terms of the sort of knowledge and access you need to work that process. So we need to look at how we can engage in, um, embed deliberation into climate policy much more generally. If you do that, I think that the actual policies that you start to design will themselves engage people. So just an example of that is that, you know, offshore wind can be seen as a huge missed opportunity in engagement terms, because if instead you had, um, you know, lots, or uh, I shouldn't say instead, I should say as well, if as well, you had um, lots of community owned wind turbines um, owned by local people with the profits going to local people, then that is actually a policy that engages and motivates in local areas. So that's very much what I'm doing now. So following from Climate Assembly, I have a, a, a four year research project at Lancaster called Climate Citizens, um, where we're working directly, very sort of collaborative research with the Climate Change Committee and um, Energy Systems Catapult and others. Although we have also um, squirreled away some of that research time and resource to look at the big difficult questions like um, the problem of economic interests and their role in the policy process. Um, so uh, we don't want to sort of 
sort of do absolutely everything in close partnership with the policy making community um, but we are working with them to actually think what would it mean to engage to, uh, to 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 have a much more deliberative approach to the setting and monitoring of carbon budgets for example um, we've just started our first empirical exercise which is called net zero diaries where we're um, asking people to write a diary of all the ways in which climate does or sometimes doesn't impact their daily lives and we'll go on to create a sort of panel of, of informed citizens who can then react in real time to different policy announcements and events. Um, so those are the, some of the things I'm doing now and I just wanted to finish with another quick uh, roundup in the chat. I'd, I'd be really interested to know, um, given what I've said this morning and also given your own um, experience and what you work on, I'd be really interested to know from you um, which transport decisions you think would really, really benefit from a sort of deliberative approach. So maybe if we have a quick fire, if we have some quick fire views on that and then I'd be really happy to um, to talk about those and take some questions. Great, thanks, uh, Becky, really great. Um, I'm sure people will be firing their uh, suggestions into the chat. You definitely just made my job more difficult of monitoring. Oh, sorry, I didn't think of that. <laughs> No, it's great. I should have said as well while we're while we're waiting for those to pop up um I've put some some references there which again I, I I don't know if we can put this on the conference website but the one thing that I'd really recommend is the documentary the people versus climate change which is on iPlayer at the moment and uh, it's a really kind of personal account of climate assembly um and yeah I'd really recommend that so what we got coming through uh, road building LTNs public transport yeah the LTNs one is really interesting and I'd be really it would be fascinated to um hear people's views on that um yeah active travel for people with disabilities yeah public transport assumptions around commuting i think that's really interesting especially after the couple of years we've had you know we can't we can't take those views for granted can we So are you, are you happy to move some uh, some general questions and yep. maybe pick up um, pick up some of those uh, examples maybe as part of part yep. of your responses? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so some um, some really um, great threads sharing. and connections um, to to the talks uh, yesterday, um, Becky, in particular, sort of the, the the vibrancy of the democratic debates going on in in Chile at the moment. We heard we heard about uh, yesterday. Um, and, I, and I talked in the morning a bit about them sort of hiding behind technocratic lines and approaches uh, rather than, than, than engaging. So you've really opened up this agenda. But um, one of the things with the, the, the citizens' assemblies that's been particularly important in, 